God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We've reserved this time on your holy Sabbath to open our minds to the truth, not only in inspiration, but throughout history, that they may give us the knowledge to bring us out of ignorance. May we think carefully and correctly about the material that we go over so our minds can be enlightened to new perspectives through what has occurred in the past so we can more truly understand the present and therefore accurately apply things in the future. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty, so last time uh, we had our study, we were looking at um, an article by Jared Goldstein, whom we should all be familiar with. Um, does anyone remember what article we're looking at? 10 points for anyone who can remember the full title. <laughs> but um, the basic gist of, of the article that we're looking at. The answer's kind of on the board. Um, we're looking at uh, the constitution and, and what in relation to the constitution. Does anyone uh, remember? Is that native Christian? <laughs> become a Christian. So I, I heard the, yeah, I heard the right answer. Yes, uh, Catherine, it's nativism. Um, so as we, as we know from uh, Elder Tessa's study, there is another article by Jared Goldstein that is uh, how the constitution became Christian. And we're all familiar with that. Um, this is one that hasn't, hasn't been looked at, um, but is by the same author. Um, and we've been going over this for a couple of studies. Uh, it's unfit for the constitution, nativism and the constitution from the founding fathers to Donald Trump. So I wasn't expecting anyone to be able to remember that mouthful. Um, but just to sort of just bring us up to speed on how far we are through this article, um, there was two aspects of nationalism that we we read about. Does anyone remember uh, just the two um, perspectives, I guess, of looking at uh, the constitution at all and how, um, what that means in terms of being an American? Everyone has a right to be a citizen. Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, we had we look. I'll give you. I'll give you a clue. So one was. Mm -hmm. Ethnic nationalism. And that's more if you share a common um uh, race or religion or ethnicity then you're automatically entitled to be a citizen of the nation compared to the other um perspective that we looked at that was brought out in the article um does anyone remember what that what that was you're kind of on the right track there with um anyone being allowed to be a citizen So is it like if you you hold to the constitution, is it something to do with that? Yes. So commitment to a common set of ideals, values, or or commitment to a creed, um, it was called. So uh, this was civic nationalism. 
So we looked at um, the article points out in part one, um, these two um, types of nationalism, civic and ethnic nationalism. And what Goldstein was pointing out um, as he went through uh, this part one. So we, we finished part one um, last time, we're on to part two. So we're gonna just do a little bit of a um, quick rehash of part one, just to bring, uh, cause it was a number of weeks ago. So we just wanna um, familiarize ourselves with what we've gone through. Um, the constitution, does anyone remember how that was described? How, how would you describe the constitution in terms of uh, the United States of America when you, when you think of the constitution? It's about, the constitution is above law. Of the law, yeah, I'm thinking more of just a um, we'll use we'll use a parable methodology, uh, which is always right. Um, if we have a, a human body, um, it was described as what what internal organ. Um, of America, if this human body is is the United States of America, does anyone remember? Yeah, the heart. Uh, it was called the the beating heart. Um, so obviously, the life of the nation. And I'll, I'll read just a, a quick portion. We will do a bit of reading today, but um, we'll try and make it as exciting as possible. Um, now this, this nationalism, this idea of the constitution, um, it was described as that the United States has this banal nationalism, which is like, daily um, and often unnoticed reminders, um, repetitive reminders of uh, that instill national identity. Um, a distilled version of the American creed, so the constitution, is invoked every day by millions of school children who pledge allegiance to the Republic and its constitutional ideals one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Before the start of sporting events, for high, high school football games to the Super Bowl, millions of Americans sing of our constitutional ideals, declaring the United States, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Candidates for office from small town mayors to presidents of the United States routinely remind us that what makes us American is devotion to the constitution. A large body of popular literature agrees that the constitution makes us who we are. A national museum is devoted to it. In case we forget, Congress has declared Constitution Day an annual holiday to remind us. So they've got, they, they repeat the, They've given a reminder of the constitution's significance at every sporting event, pretty much. Whenever uh, uh, someone gets sworn in, whether it's the president or governor or something, something like that, in schools, um, children recite the Pledge of Allegiance. There's, they have a whole national museum, and they've got a day off for um, remembrance uh, <laughs> of their, or, or in honor of their constitution. Um, so they really have no excuse to forget. Um, so there's, 
there's this constant um, constant hammering of this idea that to be American is to devote oneself to the Constitution. And so even if this wasn't the case from the beginning, over time, this becomes normal. And we find this uh, also in the same, same type of thing happen uh, as we read in Goldstein's other article, how the Constitution became Christian over time, um, just like a, a dripping tap or boiling a frog, for instance, um, things change uh, and become more and more acceptable. We read uh, that the president, uh, President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, um, made a statement that a good American is one who is loyal to this country and to our creed of liberty and democracy. And he said that this is how it's always been. So Franklin Roosevelt describes the constitution as the basis for American national identity from the very beginning of the nation. However, as we read on in the article, um, Goldstein uh, uses a political, an American political scientist and author by the name of Roger Smith. Um, and he is specializes in constitutional and political um, development um, with focus on citizenship, uh, racial, gender, and class inequalities. Um, and he, in, in response to um, President Roosevelt's statement, he said that if the conventional understanding were correct, that American nationalism is based on commitment to the American creed, then episodes in American history that conflict with the creed must be seen as mere aberrations, mistakes, when the nation diverged from its true identity. So what's, what's he talking about here? Will Have a bit of a look quickly just at history. And what Goldstein points out uh, via Roger Smith, who's highlighted this point, um, we'll put up some examples of uh, in American uh, history where they really haven't lived up to this this creed of their constitution. So for a starter we have uh, 1798 and we know um, the nation being um, founded before this period and when they arrived um, we had the Conquest, conquest of Native Americans. So much like uh, when the white settlers came to Australia and they pushed out a lot of Aborigines, killed a lot of them, did terrible things to them. Um, we had the same things happen when uh, the white settlers first came to America. In um, eighteen sixty three, we mark um, slavery was not a, a good period, and we won't go into detail in every single thing. We're just looking at over time. Um, there's a number of examples um, that that demonstrate that it, it hasn't always been about uh, agreeing with the constitution um, that entitles you to citizenship. Um, we have 1882. And this is the Chinese Exclusion Act. where the Chinese were considered too foreign to even be able to uh, assimilate with 
uh, American society and understand the constitution. 1890s, we also, segregation and it was made clear, um, not just at this point, but that whites were superior to blacks. So even if you'd been born in America, just because of the color of your skin, you were less of an American if you were black than if you were white. Um, 1920, we have uh, women's suffrage and once again, um, if you're a, a woman, you're less entitled to, uh, for instance, to vote, um, which is a, a citizen, as a citizen of a country, you have the right to, you should have the right to. Um, and then we come on to another example is 1940s. And does anyone remember uh, what happened on December 7, 1941? I should have said other than Ray, uh, but yes, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, so this was the Japanese attacking uh, the United States in Hawaii. Um, and as a result of this, the Americans then entered World War II um, and on February 19, was 1942, so only a couple of months after the, uh, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, um, the president, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt um, issued an executive order Nine zero six six. Does anyone know what this entailed? What this ex what was involved in this executive order that Franklin Roosevelt gave? Was that to do with um, putting the Japanese people into? Uh, camps basically within the country? Yes, it was. So I'll just... So instead of me drawing the United States of America on my small whiteboard, I will cheat and screen share Yes, you're right, Lynn. Uh, it was the American government um, putting uh, Japanese and even American citizens of Japanese descent into a number of camps uh, throughout the country. So we see this line up the top of the state of Washington here. By the way, I'm speaking to you from Portland in Oregon. That's I'm right here. So if I was of Japanese descent in 1942, I would have been um, rounded up and sent to a lot of these, these camps. Um, so they basically 
had this line going all the way down the west coast and they rounded up anyone of Japanese descent and they put them in in these camps um, and it was considered one of the most atrocious violations of American civil rights in the 20th century and um, as a result uh, a lot of the people living a number of years later once they were released were given compensation and, and all that but obviously that it, it doesn't negate the fact that they were all locked up even people that were American citizens um, so with that being said uh, at the at the time so this was 19, 1942 when this happened um, President Roosevelt made his statement about America being, what was it? About being an American is someone that's loyal to the country and their creed of liberty and democracy, and that's how it's always been. So he said that in 19, 1943 in February. And that was at a, it was an all Japanese platoon or unit in the army that had been made. And while, and he made that, that statement, yet people in these incarceration camps weren't released till December of 1944. So he's still, he says that, but he's locked up people of Japanese descent that, that have an American passport. So it really, double standards doesn't doesn't make sense at all um, if we look at I had a couple of other photos here that I will pull up um, so yeah these are the signage that they put up all around the, the towns. Um, there was another one that said, basically, I think I have it somewhere. I'll, I will pull that one up too. But it was a shop owner and they had, uh, they had a sign basically saying that, here we go. I'm an American, so. I'm not of, of Japanese descent or anything. Um, but these are the sorts of, of realities that the, the people faced um, in 1942, which was contrary to what the president was saying, that to be an American, you just have to believe in the same set of values. Um, yet they've gone and locked up all these um, people of Japanese descent. So we can see from the several um, events in America's history that Smith is correct in uh, his his statement that to be an American isn't hasn't always been about whether you believe in the Constitution, whether you um, hold to the set of values that are enshrined in it. What, uh, what we then read, uh, and we'll, we'll read a paragraph Okay, if someone would like to read, I've got the Got the article highlighted here, the portion of the paragraph. I'll just make that a bit bigger. Uh, 
And if someone would like to read the, the yellow portion, the highlighted portion for me, that would be wonderful. I read the history of nativist constitutional claim explored in this article serves to demonstrate that civic and ethnic nationalism should not be seen as distinct tradition in American history, but in fact have always been in the wine. Nativist movements, political movements that emphasize the privileged status of members of the nation historically dominant uh, demographic groups and opposed bestowing rights or benefits on groups because of their perceived uh, foreignness are typically described as ethnolists who define national identity by reference to racial, religious, and ethnic trait, trait in contrast to civic nationalists to define national identity by reference to shared civil value. Thank you. So as Goldstein wraps up this uh, part one of this article, he's pointing out that this civic and ethnic nationalism that we understand that's found in America shouldn't be seen as separate, but it's actually uh, intertwined amongst one another. Um, that these that they're actually two traditions that are throughout the nation's history. So we remember that. Um, in the 1840s, the Know Nothings um, believed that the Irish Catholics were incompatible. The in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, the Chinese were too foreign. And then in the National Origins Act, which we're going to get to today, uh, in 1924, believed that the Nordic race was the only uh, people that could be classed as true Americans. So we've been looking at part one of this article and the, let me just get the title of it. Um, So the title of part one is the central role of the constitution in conventional conceptions of American nationalism. Lots of words, but essentially what the constitution is. And part two also has a long uh, heading, um, but essentially part two is going, who is fit to be part of this, part of uh, who's fit for the constitution um, and therefore be part of the nation. So we're going to scroll down a bit. Here we are. So here we are. We see the that title, Who is Fit for the Constitution? The Long History of the Nativist Argument that Unwanted Foreigners Are Hostile to the Constitution. So this part provides a history of nativist invocations of constitutional commitment as a touchstone for dividing good Americans from dangerous foreigners. As this history shows, nativists have long employed the patriotic language of constitutional devotion to argue that some peoples must be excluded from the nation. So for time, we won't, we're not able to go through this whole article because it's obviously it's very long and we'll be here for a, an extended period. Um, but I've sort of picked out some of the important or the points that stand that stood out to me. Um, if someone wants to read this, 
this highlighted portion here. Uh, just in, in yellow. I can read it. Thank you. Uh, in 1751, oh, hang on. In 1751, Benjamin Franklin expressed his belief that immigration to the American colonies should be limited to the lovely white and should exclude all blacks and tawnies. Franklin conceded that his racial preferences arose because he was partial to the complexion of my country but he insisted that such kind of partiality is natural to mankind. Franklin further argued that it was not merely whites who should be preferred, but British subjects alone should be allowed to immigrate, while Germans, whom he referred to as Palatines, should be excluded. Why should the Palatine Boers be suffered to swarm into our settlements and by herding together establish their language and manners to the exclusion of ours? Why should Pennsylvania founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of us anglifying them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. So pretty, pretty horrible language, um, to be frank, uh, saying that racism is built in um, and that, that um, reducing German immigrants uh, to the animal metaphor um, and that they're going to swarm in um, and indicating that that's a bad thing. Um, also that it's okay for um, the whites to anglify the Germans, but it's not okay for the Germans to uh, Germanize um, the whites. So, and even that, not just not just dividing whites and blacks. He's he's saying whites um, as in British white. Um, so he's quite specific um, in what he considers to be uh, pure or true Americans. Okay, we have. Uh, I'll, I'll read this one. As with many subsequent nativists, Franklin described unwanted immigrants in animal metaphors as a swarm and as a herd, and their arrival in military metaphors as an invasion, admitting that these foreigners, Franklin warned, would undermine and ultimately destroy the predominant culture of the American colonies. Now, can anyone remember or does, does this type of um, language remind anyone of another study where people are compared to, um, to animals? I don't know if it's relevant, but the Australian um, Aboriginals were classed as flora and fauna up until the 70s. Yeah, it's. Makes me think of um, Elder Tessa's study where she speaks about the um, derogatory names given to blacks and compared that with the derogatory names given to females. Yeah. Um... That was that was what I was thinking of, but also what uh, you said, Greg, is is also relevant. Um, just degrading people to or dehumanising them, really. Um, and of course, society we get that gut reaction with uh, when it comes to race, but we need to have that gut reaction as well with gender. Um, so it's it's an important parallel, but it's. quite, um, there's a lot of depressing language in this article. Um, but we'll keep, we'll keep moving um, for time. Okay. So, 
So we'll go, we'll keep moving down a little bit here. So over time, um, this idea that the Nordic race was superior and that that was the actual, uh, that they were true Americans that started to become uh, we'll, we'll read this, we'll read this portion um, just for the flow of this section. Um, thus by the time of the great nativist movement, uh, that began in 1894 and succeeded 30 years later in limiting immigration to persons of the so-called Nordic race, it had long been asserted that the constitution was made solely for members of the nation's native racial stock and others must be excluded as a threat to the constitution and the American way of life. So this is talking about that, uh, the Nordic race, which were from, we went over in our, in our other study uh, they're from the northern areas of Europe um, and they were considered uh, when they immigrated to the United States, um, they were considered the original uh, Americans and that was sewed into the fabric of American history um, as we've seen and it became um, just the normal understanding of, of people and that was the American way of life. So as time went on uh, from the 1860s, there was mostly English, Irish and German immigrants to the United States. But from the 1880s, we began to see more people from Eastern Europe uh, coming in uh, from Italy, Russia, Greece, Hungary and Poland. And so then A lot of people started getting upset that there were these new immigrants that they had, hadn't seen before. Uh, they talked different. They were starting to arrive and, and invade uh, in the United States. So we're now going to head into uh, part B of this. This is part B of part two, if that makes sense. Um, so and it's about protecting the constitution from new immigrants. And there's six points in this section um, that it goes, oh look, this is the remainder of part two. So we're gonna get through this today um, and then um, we'll have the last part to do in the future. Um, and so there's these six points that Goldstein brings out Start. Here we go. And the first one is the Americanization movement. So, can someone read uh, just this, just the highlighted portion for me? I'll read it. Thank you, Joe. The, be the belief that immigrants would soon accurate rate was frequently expressed through the metaphor of the melting pot that had become part of the national vocabulary. After the production of Israel Zhang Will's play of that name in 1908. Thank you. So what the Americanization movement wanted to do was they they want they wanted to let people in but they wanted to basically get rid of all their culture that they were bringing get rid of all their their baggage um, from their the nation that they were coming from and so they came up with this uh this phrase um this term and it was called the through it was called the melting pot so we can I've got a photo here, let me find it. And this is the 
the melting pot. And it became part of national vocabulary um, because of this play by this, this chap called Israel Zangwill um, in 1908. Um, and in this process, they would, uh, all the immigrants would come in, they'd go into this pot and I think in some pictures they had the Statue of Liberty staring at um, and everyone would come out and they're American. They've got their, their American flag or whatnot. Um, so it's, it was described that the new immigrants needed um, to get rid of all this, uh, all the dross, I suppose, um, that they brought and therefore melting them together uh, was the way the way to do that and so this wasn't however a a new idea um it was actually um published in by i don't know how to say his name but his first name's hector um in 1782 uh, he published letters from an american farmer which declared that the United States various that in the United States various nationalities were melting together to create a new nation. And so this idea of uh, putting everyone in in a pot and, and stirring them together and uh, heating them would get rid of all this uh, the, the bad things and the different cultures that come out they'd speak like an American they'd walk and, and do all the things that Americans do. Um, so in response to the increasing concerns that new immigrants uh, pose, there was patriotic organizations and what they wanted to do was Americanize these immigrants. So we had uh, the daughters of the American Revolution. They uh, did a series of lectures for foreigners. Um, we then had also the Sons of the American Revolution did a similar thing. YMCA um, began offering evening classes for immigrants, uh, helped them learning the English language. Um, and this also uh, happened in a commercial setting. Henry Ford began, Ford, Henry Ford, so the guy that owns the Ford Motor Company, began requiring foreign-born workers to attend Americanization classes at his factories. Um, and at the end of these classes, they would have a, uh, which was held on the 4th of July, they would have this Americanization day and immigrants would wear their native dress um, from wherever the nation they came from. And they would descend from a model boat into a large pot labeled melting pot and then after a, a time where school the school's teachers would stir with uh, these big huge 10 foot long ladles the immigrants would emerge from the pot wearing uh typical american clothing um, and they'd be waving american flags um so this ceremony perfectly captured the widespread notion that through education in common American culture, immigrants would lose their uh, backward foreign ways and become good patriotic Americans. Um, can anyone see the, the problem though with this, uh, uh, this whole program, this whole idea of um, getting rid of all the dross from everyone? It's assuming that wherever they've come from is wrong or bad. And in order to be good, they need to put on what is deemed good um, in, to every degree that they're capable of doing. Um, so that's one thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of... Um... Anyone new that comes needs to get rid of everything 
that they've once once known, you know, from their culture, um, their dress, their language, and that, that what they have known is of no value in America. It's it's quite degrading. Um, it's actually anti-constitution. Yes. So, of course, we, we understand how important it is um, how we read um, and how you interpret things. So these, these people are interpreting the, the Constitution in the wrong way and therefore they don't realise that they're actually going against the Constitution. But it was said that this melting melting pot process was purifying them, so they're they're insinuating that they're they're unclean, you know. Um, but additionally, the fact that they were taught by um, as soon as they landed on American shores, they were instantly, uh, you know not on an equal level with American citizens. Um, for instance, Luke. they were instantly a student. Sorry, did someone have a comment? Oh, uh, sorry. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's like they, um, and I remember Elder Tess presenting this as well. It's like they have an idea of what a, uh, an American is. It's like a prototype, the epitome yeah. of, a, of what an American needs to be. And anything outside of that prototype is a threat. And so all these immigrants they perceive as a threat because they don't fit the prototype that they they've they have in their minds. Yeah, they, they see that that group threat from all these foreigners. And um, that's that's kind of what we're we're looking at as we go into the next point. Um, the different ways people saw foreigners and their different reactions. So, and I just make, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say I was thinking of another thing too because they put all these foreigners through this process so to eradicate the things that offended them that they determined were no good and all of that and as you said, very demeaning. However, when they came out and adopted all of what they were told to adopt, they still weren't really accepted anyway. They still were seen as lesser, anyhow. Yeah, and because they've, like, I, I suppose, the the way the it's written in the article, the American, any American was always a teacher, and therefore a foreigner was always a student. So you always had that imbalance. And even once they've graduated, um, you know, there's. There's still that that imbalance, but like you said, they're going to be looked down upon because, of course, all the they didn't they couldn't change their features, they couldn't change um, exactly their skin color and yeah, all of that. Skin color. Um, Probably difficult to change their accent. Plus, it's it's just basically inequality, regardless. Well, yeah, I, I think you'll you'll agree that I still sound Australian, um, and I've been here for six months in America. Um, yeah. I mean, there's certain words that I change just so I don't have to repeat myself, but it's, it doesn't, get you, you know, you can't just put someone in a pot and expect, you know, through a program um, and expect them to then just all of a sudden at the end be, wow, you know, shining light American. So, That's it. So the Americanization movement had this um, melting pot idea and also uh, the patriotic lots of patriotic societies um, that had American value programs for all these um, foreigners. Now, for time, we won't read everything that uh, I've got in my notes here for us to go over, because um, we 
we've sort of got the gist of, of what what their what point one's talking about, what the Americanization movement is. Um, the next point, uh, point two. Uh, now I have all these notes everywhere, so I'm gonna rub it out, but don't stress if you do want things later, I can send it to you. Um, we then look at a, a different aspect um, compared to the Americanization movement who, whose people wanted to, were happy to have immigrants come in. Um, we then had, and I don't need to explain uh, in too great detail because the name of their league um, gives it away, the immigration Restriction League. So on one hand, we've got the Americanization movement, um, welcoming immigrants, but wanting to change them. Um, we also, have on the other hand uh, the Immigration Restriction League that um, worked to exclude all immigrants, to restrict them, to not allow them in the country, um, certain immigrants. And we'll find out uh, what those immigrants, or who those immigrants were as we go on. Um, it was founded by three Harvard graduates and they declared that the group's purpose was to advocate for the exclusion of elements undes undesirable for citizenship or injurious to our national character. And this is this is something this is something they said. We thought that sending alien children to school, teaching them English giving them flag drills and making them read the Declaration of Independence and recite the Gettysburg Address would make them Americans almost overnight. Yet the laws of heredity are at work. We cannot make a heavy draft horse into a trotter by keeping him in a racing stable. We cannot make a well-bred dog out of a mongrel by teaching him tricks, nor can we make a race true to the American type by any process of Americanization. So they're saying it's impossible. It's too hard to Americanize immigrants. Therefore, the only other option is to restrict them totally. So the IRL, they were called, They deemed immigrants uh, incapable of loving the Constitution And also that uh, immigrants were if you're an immigrant, you're most likely illiterate. You were a criminal. Or you had uh, or you were insane, you had some uh, mental um, health condition. And that the only, uh, the only true immigrants could be people from Northern Europe, essentially. So So if you are from Northern Europe, 
you're allowed in. But if you were from pretty much anywhere else, not allowed. And the way they wanted to do this, which brings us to uh, part three, is they wanted to introduce a literacy test. Um, and so anyone coming into the country would have to do this um, literacy test and be able to prove that they could, um, that they had an ability to read and understand English uh, and portions of the constitution. And the IRL believed that such a test would effectively exclude members of undesirable races and ethnicities because if they could not even read the constitution, they surely could never embrace its principles. So this is where we get to So this liter literacy test was on the IRL's agenda because uh, they wanted to exclude people from certain ethnicities. Uh, and they proposed this to Congress um, and it was passed by both houses So the IRL propose this literacy test and it was passed in both houses of Congress. But it was vetoed by the president at the time. Uh, it was President Cleveland. And so we have in 1896, uh, Congress passed this proposal. So they passed the IRL proposal. And then in uh, the next year, 1897, the president Cleveland said no. And but that, that didn't stop um, the Immigration Restriction League. Um, they were in this for the long haul and it got uh, brought up again in 1913 and a different president vetoed at this time. President Taft said no. And a couple of years later, we had in 1915, uh, President Wilson said no. But they kept on at it. And eventually, in 1917, we have the Immigration Act. 
and it got through in during that act. Um, so, however, uh, what I thought was, I guess, a bit amusing. Um, the Immigration Re Restriction League worked so hard to get this literacy test through. By the time it actually got through, um, the literacy rate in Southern and Eastern Europe had risen dramatically since the test was first proposed in the 1890s. Um, so when it actually got passed um, in 1917, it actually didn't do much to stop immigration. Uh, and I thought that was that was quite amusing. And in fact, some of the immigrants were more literate than um, American nationals. So uh, that was kind of took the, the wind out of their sail there. Um, and then once we get to Oh, we're now in the period of World War I, um, and this is where we have, um, just write it up quickly, to do with the, uh, the Americanization movement. Because of World War I, lots of things were happening, lots of people were fleeing um, their country, and, but, of course, people in America were then worried about immigrants coming in because of the war. So the Americanization movement um, began to decline. So, and, and because of this, uh, the, this was due to the end of, of World War I. And at this point, because um, public support for uh, continuing these programs to Americanize immigrants um, had declined so much, then Congress decided to uh, cease their funding. Because after we mentioned uh, like the YMCA doing programs, um, Henry Ford doing programs that his commercial operations, um, that led to then governments uh, on the state and other levels um, beginning programs. So, but by uh, the end of World War One, support for putting all these immigrants into a melting pot, figuratively, obviously, and um, getting rid of all their cultures and stuff, um, people just didn't want immigrants because they were worried about the war and worried about people coming in, kind of like the same thing with World War II, um, but in that case, uh, Americans locked up fellow Americans just because of the way they looked, um, just because of where they were from. So we then come to the National Origins Act. And this one's titled The National Origins Act. Uh, 
and the triumph of nativism. So we'll read a portion from this section. Let me find it. Okay. If I could have a volunteer just to read that highlighted section, that'd be great. I can read it. Thank you. In March 1919, advocates of strict immigration control gained control of Congress and the chairman of the House Immigration Committee became Albert Johnson, an enthusiastic nativist and member of the IRL-supported Eugenics Research Association. Johnson was convinced that the nation's immigration laws should be based principally on eugenics and the need to preserve the nation's racial heritage. Thank you. So as a result of the National Origins Act, immigration was most heavily restricted uh, to the class that some deemed undesirables. Um, does anyone know what the word eugenics means? Because I didn't. <sighs> Isn't it to try and change their DNA? Yeah, it's the definition I found said more or less the same thing. Uh, a set of beliefs and practices that aim to improve the genetic quality of a human population. Uh, historically, by excluding people and groups judged to be inferior or promoting those judged to be superior. Uh, so not not a nice um, not a nice word even. Um, but this this uh, national origins act um, prohibits immigration of those who were ineligible for naturalization. So when you came to America, um, they had the naturalization. Act um, that had already passed both houses and all that was already um, in the mix, and essentially it pretty much barred all immigration from Asia because of the colour of their skin, the way they looked. Um, so if you came from, you couldn't come to America and live in America uh, if you were from that part of the world. And what this National Origins Act <clears throat> so it was in 1924, the National Origins Act. And <clears throat> it basically said uh, if you're white, you you can come to America. Um, and They had um, percentages of 
people that were allowed or percentages of uh, origins of, of nationals who were allowed to uh, come into the country and settle. Um, and there's, I believe, we'll read a little bit down. Yes, this one. Careful. So this one's a little bit long, um, but if someone was willing to read that, that'd be splendid. I'm happy to read that if you like. Thank you. Let me go back up. Mm. In 1924, Congress enacted the National Origins Act, also known as the Johnson-Reed Act, which extended and made permanent the national origin system for immigration restriction it had begun to construct in 1921. The 1924 Act sought to freeze the nation's racial and ethnic mix as of 1920 by allocating the annual number of immigrants based on the national origins of the nation's white populations as of 1920. As a presidential commission created by the Act later determined, 79% of the white population in 1920 were descended from the countries of Northern and Western Europe. And as a result, those countries were allocated 79% of the annual immigration quotas. In contrast, because only 15% of, of the white population was estimated to be descended from the countries of Southern and Eastern Europe, countries in those areas were allocated 15% of the annual immigration quotas. In addition, the National Origins Act prohibited immigration of any people who were in incligible? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's cut it. I can't see the yeah. thing. It looked like a C. Ineligible. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Ineligible for naturalization, which effectively eliminated all immigration from Asia because the Naturalization Act of 1790 continued to bar naturalization by persons who were not white. Thank you for reading that, uh, that paragraph. Um, that's quite quite terrible um, as we're used to in this study finding uh, reading things like that um, so what is essentially what they did um, in 1920 they said right oh, we're going to count all the uh, only include white immigrants um, and the they wanted to freeze essentially um, the ethnicities of the people that were already in the country. So 79% um, of the white population um, in 1920 came from Northern and Western Europe. And so therefore Northern and Western Europe would be allocated 79% of the annual immigration quotas. And whereas countries of Southern and Eastern Europe, which only consisted of 15% of the white population in America, they were only given 15% of the immigration quota. So you can see how unequal um, this is. So even though they're white, um, they're from Europe, there's clearly a preference um, for where you've come from. And they're just really trying to solidify the, uh, the Nordic race in the country. Other. 
So what this also did was, uh, which we already spoke about, um, it effectively eliminated anyone, any immigration from Asia whatsoever. Um, so if you were not white, you couldn't, you weren't allowed to come into the country. And this was this was by order of the um, the government. So this isn't just the Immigration Restriction League saying this. This is uh, the government's now supporting what the Immigration Restriction League wanted. The president, Calvin Coolidge, um, made it clear that he supported race-based restrictions precisely to preserve the, nation, the nation's constitutional values. Coolidge had declared that in identifying those immigrants who are tempor temperamentally keyed for our national background, there are racial considerations too grave to be brushed aside for any sentimental reasons. Coolidge had declared in his 1923 State of the Union message that the nation had been created by people who had a background of self-government and that immigration should be restricted to those racial groups with the same background. Preservation of the, nation, uh, the nation's constitutional values required that the nation must stay white, or as Coolidge more succinctly put it, America must be kept American. So just in that statement, it, it's, it says so much. Um, Americans must be kept American and therefore immigrants must be kept as immigrants, um, outsiders, they, they, they aren't welcome. Um, So the, the last point um, we get onto is this National Origins Act, uh, the codification and uh, the codification of the racial hierarchy. Okay, so in adopting this National Origins Act, Congress made nativism the nation's official policy. And what, uh, let's have a look at the article. see. So this, this law, um, it had a lot of impact on the actual immigration in America. So does someone want to read um, that, that quote for us? I think that's nearly our, our last one. Yeah, that's our last quote. 
I'll read it if you like. Thank you. In adopting the National Origins Act, Congress made nativ nativism the nat nation's official policy. As its proponents hoped, the law succeeded in greatly reducing immigrants they deemed undesirable. Before the passage of the Act, around 200,000 immigrants had arrived from Italy each year. But beginning in 1924, the annual quota for immigrants from Italy was set at less than 4,000 per year. Russia and Poland, which together had sent hundreds of thousands of immigrants to the United States, were allotted slightly less than 10,000 per year. In contrast, countries of Northwest Europe, England, Germany and Ireland were together allotted 100,000 immigrants per year. Um, though in practice, immigration from these countries remained far lower because there were far fewer people from these countries who sought, the sought to be immigrate, sought to immigrate. Immigration from Japan was effectively eliminated. Thank you. So what we see from, so we're looking at the, the effect from the cause of the National Origins Act. So beforehand, uh, from Italy, we had 200,000 immigrants coming into the United States uh, every year. And after, only 4,000. From uh, Russia and Poland, beforehand there we had more than 200,000 coming in. And afterwards, only 10,000. Then we contrast that to Northern and Western Europe. And there's, we weren't given a figure of how many beforehand, but we do know that that those immigrants from this area of Europe um, increased dramatically. So you can see that the Immigration Restriction League and their, uh, their ideas, their beliefs of keeping the undesirables, as they termed them, out and allowing um, people from the Nordic race to enter uh, America um, would ultimately then make America more American uh, because their idea of being American through this national, demonstrated through this National Origins Act um, was this principle that the United States is a white nation and it needs to remain a white nation. So anyone, uh, any American that would, um, for instance, African Americans, Asian Americans, Mexican Americans and Native Americans simply didn't count. They didn't, that pretty much didn't exist. Um, they were raised anyone from the Western Hemisphere um, were just not considered to be American. So as we've gone through these, this part two of Goldstein's article, um, we recognize that there's, there was these two, two movements, one being the Americanization movement, and they 
wanted to allow uh, immigration. They were happy to let people in, but they still required people to change. So I, I almost saw a similarity there with um, quotas almost um, and just being the, the form and not actually changing the spirit because if they truly wanted to, were, were for immigration, um, they would welcome people in how they are. They wouldn't want them to change. They wouldn't try and change them. Um, but what they were doing was, their idea was to let people in, but those people weren't worthy of being American until they'd gotten rid of all their baggage, gotten rid of all, all their, their um, customs and, and traditions and, um, and religions from wherever they came in the world. Um, they deemed that to be an American, you had to get rid of all that and be like everyone who was from North and Western Europe, um, so white Americans. Um, then we looked at the Immigration Restriction League and it's obvious how abhorrent their uh, policies were, but they, although they did get um, held up a little bit for a, a period of time, but they ultimately succeeded in getting the National Origins Act through Congress um, with the support of the government. Um, however, at the time with the literacy test, it didn't really have much of an effect um, upon restricting immigration. Whereas compared to the National Origins Act, um, they really, uh, you know, honed in where they wanted um, immigrants to come from, where they where they preferred them to come from, and heavily restricted anyone else. Um, and even just as we saw with, if you're from Latin America, uh, if you're from Africa, uh, if you're from uh, Asia anywhere, or if you're an American Indian, even um, you you weren't considered to be American. And of course, during this period, the Americanization movement um, began to decline because of the, uh, the World War and people were seeing that they uh, were, were afraid uh, of, of people coming in that they weren't um, used to just because of the war and they obviously didn't, they wanted to protect themselves because they, they saw this threat by immigrants. Um, and Therefore, trying to change immigrants uh, wasn't, it became less and less popular. Um, and, and that's how the Americanization movement declined um, and ultimately ended. Um, so that's more or less part two of the article. We've looked at um, what the, the role of the constitution is, how it's perceived in part one and now we have gone through who is eligible or who is fit, um, who is perceived to be fit to understand the constitution and ultimately be an American. So the next Part is the persistence of nativist beliefs about constitutional fitness. And this is the last section. Um, we'll see how we go next time for, for getting that done in one, but it, there's a bit in there, but uh, really looking forward to continuing um, this article and, and it's going through um, to understand um, Though it be uh, not nice uh, history, um, it's still important that we we learn it, recognise that it's happened, and uh, therefore we can uh, be more prepared for uh, things that are not only happening around us now, um, but we can also draw parallels 
um, between the past and the present and also be confident that we have things, uh, what we understand that is going to happen is correct. Um, so if you're able, we will uh, we'll close in prayer. God in heaven, we thank you for many blessings that you bestow upon us. We thank you for this history that we've been able to cover, though it be not so pleasant. As we recognise so many instances of racism throughout this dispensation in America, may we understand why human beings thought it was okay to treat others in this fashion. That in using the wrong methodology and by not understanding cause and effect, one can stray so far from what you originally designed this world to be. A world of inclusiveness, of equity and love. Thank you for empowering us with parable methodology that grants us the ability to come to correct conclusions with confidence. And may this lead others into the path of righteousness. Most of all, as we examine these histories, may we grow in stature and in favour with you and all humankind as we esteem others above ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.